1944, Normandy, France. In the midst of World War II, American, British, and Canadian forces have launched a long-awaited invasion of Western Europe, aimed at pushing across France to defeat Nazi Germany. But more than a month after successfully storming ashore in Normandy on D-Day, Allied troops were bogged down in Normandy's hedgerow country. There, difficult terrain and determined German forces had stalled the Allied advance at the city of saint lô known to Americans as saint lô But in mid-July, a single battalion of American troops from the 116th Regimental Combat Team, a National Guard unit from Virginia, punched through German defenses outside saint lô However, German reinforcements quickly surrounded them. Soon, they were low on ammunition and rations and were slowly being whittled away. The lost battalion, as it became known, had to be rescued. The deadly assignment fell to a 36-year-old battalion commander from South Carolina, Major Thomas Dry Howie, and Howie would lead the way. It was bold leadership, and it was typical of the young major from South Carolina. It was here at the Citadel, South Carolina's military college, that Tom Howey began the military training that would take him, almost two decades later, to a position of leadership at the Battle for St. Lo. Howey had come to the Citadel from Abbeville, South Carolina, where he was born in 1908 as one of seven children. I think growing up in a small town is always a benefit to a child and um, his parents were well known in the community and uh, very strong in their church. His parents, Torrance and Cora Dry Howie, raised their children with an emphasis on character, duty, service and leadership. Howie displayed all those attributes as an outstanding student athlete in high school and upon graduation was accepted at the Citadel. There, his extraordinary leadership qualities matured. He became the leader others wanted to follow. He was voted most popular, best all around, and most versatile. He was elected president of the senior class was, uh, on the boxing team, freshman football, freshman baseball, uh, his freshman year, obviously, and then uh, in the upper class years. He was a member of the varsity football and uh, varsity baseball team. So he was a very well-rounded, uh, academically astute, athletically astute. He was a powerhouse on the athletic field as well as in the classroom. Howie's remarkable leadership ability and his dedication to duty were demonstrated in the fall of 1928 at the Citadel's homecoming football game with much larger Clemson University, which was favored to win. Howie was the school star halfback but he had to be at the state capitol on the morning of the game to take an application exam for a Rhodes Scholarship. The coach drove him to distant Columbia, and both were dismayed to learn that the exam was unexpectedly delayed. It looked like Howie would miss the big game. He took the exam, finished, uh, the coach sped back, and this is in a day when there's no interstate coming from Columbia to Charleston. Tom's in the back of the car changing into his football uniform. Uh, they get to the, the field, slam on the brakes in a cloud of dust. Tom hops out, and uh, much to the team's relief. Typically, Howie put others before himself that day. He rushed through his exam, and he lost his Rhodes Scholarship by a fraction of a point. But his leadership made a difference for his teammates who won the homecoming game in a 12-7 upset. After graduating from the Citadel, Howie was hired by Stanton Military Academy in Virginia, where he became a respected English literature instructor, a coach, the school's athletic director, and a master at raising leaders from the school's youthful corps of cadets. He was very close to the boys and he mentored all of them and, and made sure they were pointed in the right direction. 
Among those that Howie mentored was his younger brother, Frank, whose life, according to his son, was changed forever by Howie's leadership. My father went there um, about his uh, second year in high school, and he finished high school there uh, kind of with his brother as his mentor and his guide. And as my father said, that, uh, that, that his brother was, was a brother figure and a father figure and a best friend figure all in one. While teaching and coaching at Stanton Military Academy, Thomas Dry Howey joined the U.S. Army Reserve as an infantry officer and also began a family. He had met a local girl named Elizabeth Payne on a blind date that eventually led to an engagement and in 1932 to a wedding. Six years later, their daughter Sally was born and Howie proved himself to be a devoted father. When he would come home in the afternoons from SMA before dinner and, and we would play and sing and we sang uh, when the casings go rolling along and just funny things like that. He relished his family life, enthusiastically taught and coached and mentored at the military academy and actively served his community. He was well liked and didn't have to, uh, it was just his magnetic personality who attracted people to him, uh, which is a, a, an interesting quality, uh, a, a necessary quality for a leader. He also transferred from the Army Reserves to the highly respected 116th Infantry Regiment of the Virginia National Guard, which eventually became the 116th Regimental Combat Team within the U.S. Army's 29th Infantry Division. He went from the Reserves into the National Guard because he felt there was a better opportunity for him to be a part of of this war that was coming. He uh, stepped up to lead when he, he, uh, the nation called. By 1941, Howie was an experienced and effective officer in the National Guard, training soldiers for possible warfare and for good reason. The fascist dictatorship of Imperial Japan had launched a savage takeover of Mongolia, China, in other parts of Asia and the Pacific Rim. And in Europe, Adolf Hitler, the head of Germany's National Socialist Workers' Party, the Nazis, was ruthlessly pursuing his plans of domination in Europe, Russia, and elsewhere. Then on December 7, 1941, Japanese forces unleashed a surprise attack on the U.S. Pacific fleet at Pearl Harbor in Hawaii plunging America into World War II. And as an ally of Japan, Nazi Germany then declared war on the United States. Outraged and determined, Americans went to war. Tom Howey was among them. Supported by more than a decade of military service, he rose steadily in rank, from lieutenant to captain to major. In September of 1942, Tom Howey's outfit boarded a troop ship and set a course for Great Britain and World War II's European Theater of Operations. There, they began month after month of combat training. As time passed, other American troops were sent into combat in North Africa, Sicily, and Italy, but the 29th Infantry Division and its 116th Regimental Combat Team just kept training. Eventually, all the training began to make sense. They were being prepared for what leaders on both sides knew was coming, an Allied invasion to liberate Europe through France. After more than nine months of hard combat training, Howie and the other troops of the 116th learned that they had a new division commander, Major General Charles H. Gerhardt. Gerhardt was a West Pointer and a World War I veteran. He was also brash and impulsive, known for his angry, explosive outbursts 
But critics and admirers alike agreed General Gerhardt was an aggressive, hard-fighting leader. The 116th Regimental Combat Team had three infantry battalions, and Major Howey came to command one of them, the 3rd Battalion, Howey's Battalion. The general's leadership style stood in stark contrast to Howey's leadership model, which was gentlemanly, calm, deliberate, and motivational. At first, Howey was a lightning rod for Gerhardt's explosive wrath, but soon the general came to respect and depend on the mild-mannered, capable commander from South Carolina. He had hoped to, uh, at, at the end of the war, um, return uh, with the experience that he had gained while he was on active duty uh, and impart that to the young men uh, that were students at Stanton Military Academy. In mid-May of 1944, the 116th was shipped to a top secret camp in southern England. Howie and his troops knew what that meant. The Allied invasion of France would soon occur and they would probably be part of it. In reality, they would help lead it. D-Day, June 6, 1944. Allied forces struck a mighty blow against Adolf Hitler's Atlantic Wall on the coast of Normandy. Dropping from night skies by parachute and gliders and storming the beaches at dawn. More than 150,000 Allied troops landed on five codenamed beaches. The British on Gold and Sword Beaches, the Canadians on Juneau Beach, and the Americans on Utah and Omaha. Allied forces quickly fought their way off four of the five beaches. But on Omaha Beach, the invasion ground to a halt. There, the enemy defenses were strong, the beachside bluffs were high, and the German troops were tough. All the way down, as far as you could see, there was German artillery fire was going. You see that, and you could, uh, there's also, you could see traces from machine gun that was going on. That's what you would look at. It was just like the fireworks over on the only going at all the time. The, the part that, that amazed me was uh, all this wreckage here. How are we still here with all these dead people? American soldiers were slaughtered in some places, giving the beach the nickname Bloody Omaha. Much of that blood was spilled by the 116th Regimental Combat Team, which had to capture roughly half of the six-mile-long beach, and in so doing suffered more than 1,000 casualties. Major Thomas Howey was there, going ashore with a regimental headquarters group. After hours of ferocious fighting, the surviving American troops finally pushed their way off Omaha Beach. But Major Howey had made it ashore unscathed. German forces recovered and mounted a powerful counterattack. Heavy reinforcements of German infantry, field artillery, and panzer tanks blocked the Allied advance. And so did the Normandy hedgerows. The ancient, thick, natural walls of trees and vines that surrounded almost every field were unexpected barriers for the Allied armies. In key roadway hubs like Caen and St. Lo, German troops barricaded themselves behind huge fortified piles of rubble and fought savagely. Allied air power pulverized the cities, but their civilian populations and the German defenders withstood the massive attacks by hiding in ancient underground sewer tunnels and in the city's countless cellars. St. Lo was reduced to a landscape of ruins. But when the Americans tried to enter the city, the Germans reappeared, blocking every advance in each attack. The task of capturing vital St. Lo 
was given to General Gerhardt in the 29th Infantry Division with the 116th Regimental Combat Team as the point of the spear. Repeatedly, the 116th Three Battalions attacked the German defenses on the outskirts of St. Lo, but Hitler had ordered German forces to defend the city to the death. Casualties in the 116th were shockingly heavy, prompting some soldiers to grimly joke that General Gerhardt actually commanded three infantry divisions, one in combat, one in the hospital, and one in the graveyard. Then on July 15, 1944, the 116th 2nd Battalion punched through the German line within sight of St. Lo. It was the breakthrough American forces had so desperately sought, but the Germans reacted quickly. They moved in more troops and soon had the 2nd Battalion's advanced positions under intense fire. Major Howie and the troops of the 3rd Battalion Howie's battalion were ordered to rescue and reinforce the lost battalion. He was very competitive. He liked uh, getting into the thick of things and, and being successful. He, he, he was a very caring and loving person, but he also had a drive. If successful, the men of the 116th might then exploit the breakthrough into the capture of St. Lo. July 17, 1944, Howie had his men ready. He moved along the battle line from man to man, prepping them for the assault. Then they received the order to attack. The surprise assault worked. The silent bayonet charge penetrated the German line, took the enemy by surprise, and then the barrage of hand grenades knocked apart the German battle line. And Major Howie led the way personally taking out two German machine gun positions by himself. He demonstrated the true meaning of personal courage and integrity, duty, uh, honor, respect. Howie's men broke through to the second battalion, the lost battalion, reinforcing their numbers and sharing ammunition, water, and rations with their battle-weary fellow soldiers. Once his battle line was stabilized, Major Howie ordered his radio operator to send the news back to headquarters. The lost battalion had been reached and reinforced, and the road into St. Lo lay before them. But the men of the battered 2nd Battalion were too bloodied and too exhausted to make the attack on St. Lo. Howie radioed their condition to General Gerhardt, who issued new orders. Howie and his 3rd Battalion would again have to be the point of the spear. They would have to break through the German defenses and lead the way into St. Lo. For Howie, it was what a life of leadership had prepared him to do. In a letter to his daughter written before D-Day, he had shared his concept of leading men into battle. It's something like football, he wrote. Somebody has to play the game. Somebody has to beat the enemy. And all my life, I've tried to make the first team in everything. He ordered his 3rd Battalion troops into place. He knew it was an exceedingly risky mission, a life and death assault to finally take St. Lo. But he believed in his men and he believed in his mission, assuring them that this time they were going to take St. Lo, and they knew he would be there with them leading the way. By radio, Howie advised General Gerhardt that the assault was ready, and then he signed off with a promise, see you in St. Lo. He called his officers together for a final quick briefing, but suddenly a barrage of enemy mortar rounds dropped from the sky and exploded just yards away. When they heard the shriek of the incoming fire, most of the officers flattened themselves on the ground, but not Howie. Instead, he stood up to check on his men and was struck in the back by German shrapnel. It was a mortal blow, tearing through tissue and bone and penetrating his lungs. He managed to express his surprise. My God, I'm hit, he said. 
Then he collapsed into the arms of one of his officers. Moments later, Major Thomas Dry Howey was dead, killed in combat, leading his troops. Word quickly spread through the 3rd Battalion's line. Their beloved Major was gone. Some men quietly wiped away tears. Back at headquarters, meanwhile, the news left General Gerhard shocked and saddened, but no less determined to take St. Lo. He issued the order. 3rd Battalion was to advance in the lead under Howie's second-in-command, backed up by a giant force of American tanks and troops. The attack was launched, and St. Lo fell. German troops were finally defeated and driven out of the city. The necessary network of roads was now in American hands. Allied forces were finally breaking out of the hedgerow country and leading the way on the road to liberation. And in battered and cuffeted St. Lo, at General Gerhardt's order, Major Howey's body, lying on a stretcher, was placed on the hood of a jeep and led the victorious American troops into the heart of liberated St. Lo. His last words to General Gerhardt, the uh, division commander, was, I'll see you in St. Lo. Uh, and he was killed shortly after that, and the division commander made good on that, that statement and ordered that he be, uh, his body be carried at the head of the column uh, that took St. Lo. Draped in the flag, it was gently lifted onto the rubble in front of the local cathedral, as if lying in state. And there, Howie's devoted soldiers paused to pay tribute to their fallen commander, as did the other American troops that followed them into the city, as well as the grateful French citizens who had been set free by Major Howie and the American soldiers he had led. The fact that they would go to the trouble when bodies were laying all around them to pick up this particular body and to put it on a stretcher and cover it with a flag and make sure that it leads them into town, that's a, that's a noteworthy accomplishment. That's a, that's a high honor. An American war correspondent heard Major Howley's story and reported it. It was flashed back to the United States and the news sped across the nation. Howley's name could not be used yet but his story of leadership and sacrifice was reported from coast to coast. Overnight, Major Thomas Dry Howey became a national American hero as the Major of St. Lo. I do remember when, my, when he died and my mother was told that he had died. He became a symbol for other people. I think that was part of the whole thing was not only what he did, but what he, that he symbolized what all the other say, uh, soldiers had done. Any, any endeavor that you undertake, uh, apply yourself like Tom Howie did to his. You, you may not always be first. You may not always get the trophy. Uh, but your perseverance and dedication to whatever task you undertake uh, will hold you in good stead and you will rise to the top. You will persevere. You will rise to the top if you put your mind to it, and what like Tom Howie did. Less than one year after the capture of St. Lo, Allied forces forced the surrender of Nazi Germany. The war in Europe, followed by the war in the Pacific, finally ended in an Allied victory. Major Howey, meanwhile, was buried in the Normandy American Cemetery overlooking Omaha Beach, alongside the American soldiers he was so devoted to leading. Today, Howey is honored in the South Carolina Hall of Fame at his birthplace in Abbeville, at the Citadel by the Thomas Howey Bell Tower, and in France, where the flourishing city of St. Lo maintains a lasting memorial to Thomas Dry Howey's legacy of leadership as the Major of St. Lowe.